the, the beep. I mean, it's it's like flashing red. All right, we're good. We're good. I will again. I will again begin with a word of prayer, as to annoy the internet. Thank you, uh, dearly Father. We uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these students. I hope, pray that they did well in the quiz. If they didn't, uh, help them to uh, just not give up and just to try harder, or try better, or try something. And uh, I just pray you bless this class, Lord. In name I pray. Amen. Okay, so the question I have written on the board is number 31 from page 44 from the recommended homework. I would say that this is a harder version, a modified harder version of problem two on the quiz you just took, right? So the question is this, you got a car, it's going 95 kilometers per hour, right? And there's a human reaction time of 0.4 seconds before it hit, before he hits the brakes. I have learned how to spell brakes in the time between I wrote your quiz and the time I wrote this on the board, as you can see. B-R-A-K-I-N-G, as opposed to what your quiz said, which was, I was like breaking it, you know? Which is a different kind of break, you know? You know? Like I could break that Lego set to illustrate, but I really don't want to. So that's the kind of break I, anyway. I was told that you guys wouldn't notice. I guess I should have accepted that. Um, so the point, is there music? Okay, it's not just in my head, good. So the car is going along its merry way, right? 95 kilometers per hour. And then it sees um, uh, a baby. There's a baby. I'm a picture of a baby, a baby lying in the road. So no, I need to stop. So, but it's still, even though, I mean, it's not a question of this person being heartless. It's just a physical fact that even after you see the baby, it takes you a certain amount of time to hit the brakes, right? It's not a, it's not a monster. It just takes a certain amount of time, reaction time to hit the brakes. So that's this point, point four seconds. So, he, you know, he's, he's booking it down here for whatever distance that is, let's say delta x, 1. And that's, that's, you know, during a delta t of how much? 0.4 seconds, right? So for 0.4 for for seconds, he hasn't started braking yet, right? Then, hits the brakes and starts braking either at minus 3 meters per second squared or at minus 6 meters per second squared, right? So then, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's make this a happy story. There we go. Delta X2 doesn't hit the baby, just to be clear. I'm not using physics to hit infants on highways. All right? It's not what we're doing. The children are not harmed. No children were harmed in the making of this example. And so Delta X2 would be what? Well, I don't know what that is, right? <coughs> Actually, I don't know what delta x1 is either yet, do I? Can you tell me what delta x1 is? So how do we figure out? Because the sum of these two, 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 two changes in x give us the, the net distance, right? So like, what's delta x1? It should just be what? 95 kilometers per hour. Lost my five. 95 kilometers per hour times 0 0.4 seconds, right? Because velocity times, you know, V times delta T gives me change in X, provided what? I need what? I need constant velocity motion to say that, right? There's no acceleration in the first part of this story. So we just use delta X, delta, uh, V times delta T, right? V naught delta T, right? How fast is the car? I'm saying this is V-naught. How fast is the car going right here? What's its speed? Its speed is still V-naught because it's constant velocity motion while it hasn't started braking. All right, great. And then, you know, I was very friendly. I was very nice to you on the quiz because I didn't make this happen, right? I could have done that. The first version I wrote of that quiz, they had 100 miles per hour instead of 100 meters per second. And then I thought to myself, eh, for some, of the, for, for some of my students, the 100 meters per second is going to be enough of annoyance for today. 
But rest assured that on the, on the test, that 100 meters per second might well be 100 miles per hour, in which case you'd have to convert units, right? So you were saved of that trouble on the quiz. Yep. Do we have those conversions back there? Do we need to memorize You have a sheet of notes you can bring to the test, so that's an open question for you. Okay. Yep. That is not something I would provide on the test, though, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, whether or not you need to put that on your sheet, I cannot answer that. So, what we got here, let's see how, how to convert this. How about this? What's one hour? Multiply by an hour over how many seconds? How many, hour, how many seconds are there in an hour? 3,600. 60 times 60, right? Now, by multiplying by that conversion factor, we get rid of the hours and we change it to, you know, kilometers. So, what do we got here? I don't know with a calculator. Aw, oh, man. Seriously? <laughs> no, thanks. That's V naught. And it, yes, it's the initial velocity. I I think I think you got it you guys might see better in the row behind you. Just because of the I, I don't I, I don't think he's gonna bite. I mean I think it's safe. I don't know. He looks harmless. I don't know. Um, hmm. I'm going to put the answer in kilometers for a second. 95 times 0.4 divided by 0.4. I believe we have 0 0.01. Zero five six kilometers, and I will convert that now to meters. How many meters is that? <coughs> right times a thousand. So I think that's how many? Yeah, ten point five six meters. So that's that's how much distance the car travels before it even starts braking. How about delta x to 2? How, how do we find delta x2? For that one, I think about the following equation. I think about vf squared equals to v naught squared um, plus 2a delta x. But in this case, my a is negative. My, what's my final velocity? Right. Over here is. So what we have then is we can solve that for delta x, delta x2, right? Delta x2 equals to minus v naught squared, minus v naught squared divided by 2a. All right? Um, and let's see here, what was, what was the v naught? Okay, so that's, goodness gracious, some big numbers, right? Um, minus 95 kilometers per hour quantity squared, oops, the minus is outside the square, yeah, divided by 2 times what? 2 times, well, if we're doing part A, minus 3 meters per second squared. Well, yeah, per second squared. Did the units make sense on this? I, I think so. We got a meter squared over hours squared up top. We've got a meters over a meter over second squared downstairs. So we've got a net, uh, the dimension here in total is, is, is a dimension of length. If you look at how it cancels out, the dimensional analysis makes sense. But of course I have to do the calculation here, right? So um, as it stands, that's 95. Well, I guess we want to convert. I think that, for me, the, 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 the neatest way to do this, like the most orderly way to do this, would be to convert the 95 kilometers per hour into meters per second at this point. 
So I, I would do that separately, not try to do it all together. So let's just go off to the side, you know, sidebar. 95 kilometers per hour. Let's convert that to meters per second. Um, we take that, we multiply it by an hour over 3,600 seconds, right? And then 1,000 meters divided by one kilometer. So how many, how many meters per second is 95 kilometers an hour? What I hear? 26.4. Yay. All right. Meters per second. And so I can go put that number in here, and I've got minus parentheses 20. Actually, can I get rid of the, the minuses cancel, right? Let's just cancel the minuses. So we've got 26.4 meters per second quantity squared divided by minus 6 meters per second squared. What's that work out to? Hundred and sixteen point one six. I'll make that a two. Hundred sixteen point two meters, roughly speaking. Right. So there you go. The the net distance, the stopping distance, then is delta x one plus delta x two, which is ten point five six meters plus one hundred and sixteen point two meters, which is in fact what. Looks like a hundred and hundred and twenty six point eight or seven, I guess. See that's point five six plus point two is point seven six, so I'd, I'd say point eight. But I'm I'm the the last digit here. I'm not entirely certain of yeah. So something like that. Now, the book may well attend to sig figs, in which case it probably doesn't have that answer exactly. It's probably got 130. Okay. I could see how that would happen. Yeah. But the significant figures is the less important. The more important thing here is to understand the method of the solution. Does this make sense to you, what we did? The dividing up into different parts of the motion and treating each by the appropriate set of physical laws, right? Because to start with, we have the constant velocity motion, which has velocity is, you know, the distance is velocity times time. That's not true for the second part of the motion because here we have a deceleration, I mean, a negative acceleration. So it's no longer the case that the distance covered is just velocity times time because the velocity is changing, right? So if you said distance is velocity times time, which velocity would you be talking about? I mean, okay, if you want me to tell you the truth, it would be the average velocity and you could find it that way. But anyway, that is a quirk of the, <laughs> the um, well, I'm going to shut up. This is a good way to do it. So let's just do it that way. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, sir. Ah, yes, because VF is equal to zero. So this is zero. And then to go from here to here, I used algebra. Yeah. And now, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so here's a, here's a thought. You know, sometimes this formula, we, we use like this, right? Fine. Sometimes we're actually solving for VF or V naught or something. But a lot of times, it's true. We use this formula as follows, right? So it seems to me, if I was one of you guys, I would probably have this on my, my, my sheet of formulas because that's a, that's a super nice formula to know, to know about and use. But you've got to know when it applies, right? When does that formula apply? It, it would still, yeah, constant acceleration. Now, you, you, you said when we don't know the time. Now, that, that's, that's when it's most useful. But even if you know the time, you could still use it. I mean, so, yeah, us math people, we're very literal. And it's, it's, it's our... Yeah, one of my many defects. Anyway, I will. I'll, if you say something in class, I will. I almost always respond to what it literally means, as opposed to the heart of your meaning. That's just that's my default as a math person. You know, it's why we don't get along with other disciplines that well. We have a higher standard for truth. Oh, oops, sorry. 
we have a saying, you know, people have it down to a science, right? A better saying would be, you have it down to a math. That in here, all right, fine. You obviously don't know enough math. I'll fix it. <clears throat> so before I um, play with the Legos, which we will do soon, I have a little bit more vector stuff to share with you. It, it should be clear enough how you do part B, right? OK. And by the way, you notice that the way I approach this problem makes it really easy to do part B after you've done part A? Why was that? Because I think symbolically, right? A lot of times students have a temptation, and I did it up here. I put the numbers in at the start, right? It's a really good first step to have instead written, like a better solution, really, would have been if I had written, you know, delta x is equal to v naught delta t like that, and then wrote the numbers in. And, and the reason for that is simple, is that if you have a problem which has different parts, it's really nice to be able to see like symbolically what you're doing. That's more apparent here. Here I found that delta x2 was v naught squared over minus v naught squared over 2a, right? So when I think about a being two different things, I have one way of doing it that will work for both. So all I'm saying is there's a temptation you guys have to put numbers like up here. Just put the numbers into that one and then do algebra with numbers. It's much easier to do algebra with letters than with numbers. So it's just a sort of a generic game plan for working out things in here. I'll just, it's just, I'm just speaking from experience here, guys. Um, I tutored physics for, you know, a couple of years as an undergraduate. I worked, we had this thing called the uh, Physics Math Tutorial Center at NC State where I worked. That was a sweet deal. I made $9 an hour, like 1998 to 2000, somewhere in there. $9 an hour tutoring math and physics. And a lot of the time, there weren't students in there. But they had, a, they had a bank of iMacs, which were brand new back then, these shiny things. And there was this game called Quake. And you had to understand, before that, like when I was a teenager, we were like calling into bulletin boards through a dial tone modem. So the idea that you had computers networked, that you could play three-dimensional games while your friend was sitting next to you in the same three-dimensional environment, that was just radically new at that time. For you, you're like, yeah. And that's why I don't do homework. But um, sorry, <laughs> yeah, there must be at least one game addicted person in this room. Um, <clears throat> anyway, getting to the point, I tutored a lot of physics there. And so I know a fair amount about how you guys work because you have the same bad habits all those students did, you know? So I'm just telling you. All right. Um, Oh, yes, vectors. So a little bit more I want to share with you about vectors. Part two. So I'm going to pose to you a simple question. Well, a relatively simple question. You have a triangle. P, Q, R in three-dimensional space, right? I could be talking about the triangle formed from, say, this point at the top of the board, right? Um, this point here on this desk, and oops, that point here, right? That's a triangle in three-dimensional space. So if I was to ask you, like, you know, what's the angle up at that corner that's made with this triangle in three dimensions? How would you, could you figure out the angle of the triangle? If I gave you the the points for the vertices, like, here, let's, let's, let's try to guesstimate them. What do, what do you think, if, if we call that point up there Q, what would the coordinates be to that? If, let's use feet. If we're, again, we're using our coordinate system, which has the z-axis here, right? The y-axis that way, and the x-axis that way. So looks to me like we've got z equals to about Seven, I don't know, six. What, how, how high is that? It's taller than me. I think it's, I'm, let's, let's just say eight for good measure. That's probably too much, but there you go, eight. 
we'll do this all in feet. And how about, how, about, um, how about x? How far over in x is that? Actually, the whole front wall is x equals to 0. So the x-coordinate of that is 0. I'm, I'm always going back to this generic picture, guys. This is x. This is y. This is z. So x is 0. Um, z is 8 for the upper point there. And what would y be? I mean, estimating, right? Well, this is an 8-foot board. Right? So it looks like it's about, well, two of those, and then a little bit more. So maybe, maybe 18. Yeah? So that's the coordinate to this point. What would the coordinate be to this point right here, which I'm calling uh, P? Here, I'll adjust my picture. What would the coordinates be for that point P up here? Yeah. Can you guys estimate it for me? I'll do the X at zero. How, what's the Y? Five. Five. I'll take it. And Z? About the same, right? Eight. And how about this point R? Now R, you'll recall, was, was this point here. So I think that the Z, I mean, the Z, this is actually going to be 30 inches, but to be lazy, we'll say it's two feet. So two feet. Right? And um, let's see here. The, uh, looks like the Y coordinate, I, I would say it's about six. I think if you lay down here, eh, maybe seven. Let's say seven for the Y. What's the X coordinate? You got to think about taking this point right here, the center, the you know corner desk here. So how far is that in the X? What four, maybe three, two? All right, we'll go with three. Math is always governed by consensus. It's important. Um, all right, so then what's the angle? I asked what this angle was was up here, theta. What's the angle theta? I mean, if we could get pieces of string and stretch them between these points and then take a little sheet of paper and like put it on top of the strings and like draw a little line then we could take the piece of paper put it down a desk and make a little protractor and measure the angle right we could all do that yeah <sighs> three would be y seven would be. no the x is is oh thank you yes very good very good very good very good you're exactly right because the y is how far this way Thank you. That's a very helpful comment. Wait a minute, no, the x is how far this way. You know, so 7 is the x, and 3 is the y. Thank you, yes, very good. So what's that angle, right? I think you guys can recognize that's kind of a tough question to answer, right? But it's easy with vectors. Let me show you how. So all we have to do is we have to look at vectors like we can look at the vector that goes this way, which is the what? That's the, the QR vector. Like that vector goes this way. And up top, we can look at the, the QP vector. What are those vectors? Can we calculate those before we do anything else? Let's go ahead and calculate them. What's QR? That would be R minus Q, which is what? QP would be P minus Q. What would that be? It's like minus, I think I, think I got 0, minus 13, and um, looks like 0 again, yeah? That makes sense. The, the point P here, right, and the point the point Q, which I put over here, there's, there's no change in the X or the Z direction, right? They're like basically along the same vertical height, yeah? So the only, the only change in those two points is in the, in the middle coordinate in the Y. It's minus 13. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, 
I'm an idiot. So that was this one. Thank you for interrupting me. I, I would have gotten very confused in about two minutes. I appreciate that. Thank you. So what about QR? What's that, what's that one? Seven, three minus, minus 15 and negative six. All right, great. Now, question, what, it, what, are, what are the lengths of those vectors? Can you tell me the lengths? What, what's the length of, what's the, what's, the, what's the length of the QR vector? How, how long is it? What's the length of the QP vector? How long is that one? And by the way, these are feet, right? I, I'm trying to put units on things here. I, I forgot sometimes. Look at that. You know, in mathematics, we a lot of time leave off the units. It's a bad habit I get into, and you have to talk me out of it if I do it in here. <coughs> so, I mean, I need a calculator. It should be the square root, right? It's the square root of 7... 7 squared plus minus 15 squared plus minus 6 squared, and that gives us a total unit of feet. So what's 49 plus 225 plus 36? I have no idea. It's what? 310, and what's the square root of 310? 17.6, all right, I'll buy that. 17.6 feet, that makes sense to me. And how about the, what's the length of the QP vector? Oh, 13. It's 13. All right, now here, you're like, well, how does that, how does that help us find the angle, right? Well, that's where a, another really beautiful thing about vector analysis comes into play. There's something called a dot product or a scalar product, and here's how this works. If we take a vector A, and we dot product with the vector B, all right, that actually works out to A, B, cosine of the angle between them. So this wonderful formula allows us to calculate angles using dot products. Now, then the question is, what on earth do I mean by a dot product, right? Let me give you the definition of that. Here, the definition of dot product is simply this. A dot B is equal to A1, B1 plus A2, B2 plus A3, B3, where I'm using the notation A is the vector A1, A2, A3, and B is the vector B1, B2, B3. Let me, let me do a dot product for you, all right? Then we'll come back to my triangle problem, eh? So if we took, for example, the dot product of 1, 2, 3 feet, let me, let me skip the feet if you don't mind, dot product with uh, minus 1, 2, 0, all right, then this by definition is 1 times minus 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 3 times 0 in other words, the dot product of that vector and that vector is equal to 3. Let me, let me play a little bit more with this example before I go back to my, the one I started us with. If I, if I call this vector A, if I call this vector B, what's the length of A? So in physics, we, we often just drop the 
Here's our notation. We drop the vector symbol and just write a for the length of a, the magnitude of a. So the magnitude of a is what? The square root um, 1 plus 4 plus 9, whatever that is. Square root of 14, yeah? What's the length of b? Square root of 1 plus 4 plus 0, which is square root of 5. So the boxed theorem, all right, that boxed, that, that theorem I wrote for, the, the, the boxed formula is a theorem. All right, that theorem is essential. Do you guys ever hear about the law of cosines? That is essentially the law of cosines packaged in vector notation. It's a very powerful result. Um, it's a non-trivial bit of geometry, really. And so when I calculate a dot b is a b cosine theta, you notice what I have? I've got, I've just worked it out. This is 3, and these are the lengths of a and b, respective. So that's like square root of 14, square root of 5. Cosine of the angle, I don't know. So we can solve for cosine theta. It's 3 over, you know, the square root of, you know, you combine, when you have square root of a product, it's a product of square root. So that's actually just the square root of 70, because four, 14 times 5 is 70. So that's 3 over the root, 3 over root 70 is cos cosine theta. Then we just take the inverse cosine of both sides. So theta is the inverse cosine of 3 over the square root of 70. So that tells me that the angle between these two vectors, which I have not even pictured, is whatever that angle is. I can try to picture them foolishly. A is something like this. B is something like this, I guess. I don't know exactly. And the angle I'm picturing here is theta. So can you tell me what the inverse cosine of 3 over root 70 is? This is something you'll need to figure out in your calculator this semester, right? We do do triangle stuff in here. Trigonometry, I guess we call it. Yeah. 68.9. OK. 9 degrees. So I, I figured out that that angle is 68.9 degrees, you know, without even really using that picture. And I can do the same thing for the three points in physical space I proposed at the start of this, ex this discussion. <laughs> right? So all I have to do to figure out that angle I was talking about up at, the, up at Q is I have to do what? I have to calculate the dot product of QR and QP. What is it? What's the dot product of QR and QP? Can you tell me? It's, it's 7 times 0. Um, plus minus 15 times minus 13 plus minus 6 times 0. I do the x times the x plus the y times the y plus the z times the z, z times the z. This is the dot product of two vectors. What does that work out to? I don't, I don't know. Looks like the last two things are 0. We just have the middle one. 100 what? 195. Yowzers. Uh, 195. Now, if I was being careful, this has got a units of feet squared, right? So it's actually 195 feet squared, keeping the units here. That's important because when we go to use the boxed formula, what do we got? We've got 195 feet squared is equal to, well, 17.6 feet times 13 feet times the cosine of the angle we don't know. And now we can solve for the angle. No paper or string or protractor required. We just use what's called analytic geometry. So cosine theta, you notice that the feet squareds cancel, right? And so cosine theta would be 195 divided by 13 times 17.6, whatever that is. So therefore, theta is equal to inverse cosine of 19.5, I'm sorry, not 19.5, 195, duh, 195 divided by 13 times 17.6. Now, before we actually calculate that, do you guys care to guess it? 
Like, how would you ask if you had to estimate that angle, right? So try to mm, try not. Can't, I, if I was taller, maybe I'd have a chance. We need some basketball player. Maybe not even that. Something beyond that, right? I don't know. Be a basketball player standing on the back of someone else, or maybe just anybody standing on the back of somebody else. I don't know. Anyway, I'm guessing. Eh. I'm, I'm going to estimate the, this angle we're going to calculate. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it. I'm going to guess it at 42 degrees. I really don't know. Maybe 40, 42-ish. What do we got for this? Can you guys anybody figure it out for me? 31.5. Huh? Okay. I was just 10 degrees off. <laughs> I'm I'm fairly happy with that. So, this goes back to an older story. You know, physics is. Of course, a natural science, right? What's the oldest natural science, arguably? We forget about this sometimes, but geometry. Geometry is perhaps the first natural science, just measuring distances between points and using that to describe the interrelation between things, right? That's geometry. That comes before physics. I mean, you need geometry before you can even talk about position, velocity, acceleration, the rest of it. And so I'm just sharing with you a little bit more of three-dimensional coordinate geometry. I think that really should be part of this course. Anyway, I hope you see that this actually makes a pretty straightforward and not that bad test question if you look at it. I just give you three points and you have to calculate you know, the vector that connects the two points and then find the angle between them. If you know about this dot product thing, it's pretty easy to do that. These thoughts are also contained in the lecture two that I linked for you guys. All right, and we can do another one of these some other day. But I'm, I'm going to go on now. I just I wanted to, you know, usually when I teach physics, I take like the first two or three lectures to just do vector stuff after vector stuff after vector stuff. But I don't think you guys would appreciate that. I don't think there, you have the patience for that amount of just continuous onslaught of math. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of spacing it out, and we keep coming back to the vector concept every so often. All right. So let's leave the vector concept ag behind again for a while and let's talk about projectile motion. All right? So hard segue to projectile motion, if you don't mind. <clears throat> so projectile motion, I'm going to erase all this. So here's the deal with projectile motion. What is projectile motion, guys? So this is a this is a two-dimensional problem. All right? And what what makes a projectile a projectile? Can you tell me? Like what's the definition in terms of just basic physics? Moving through the air. Moving through the air? And what else? What would they do? Oh man. Ooh. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's dead. It did not survive. Um, I'm not gonna pick that up. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I gotta get something to pick it up with. Okay. In in short, the difference between okay, for example, do you guys know what a bottle? Have you ever seen a bottle rocket? We used to have bottle rockets. You old enough to remember? How do Americans let bottle rockets become illegal? Sad chapter in our independence, I tell you. Anyway, when I was little, you used to be able to get these things called bottle rockets. Or you could get a rocket, all right? I'm sure some of you have rockets. So th actually, this would be a distinction. A mortar would be a projectile, but a rocket would not. See, a projectile is just it's traveling, and the only external force on it in our consideration is gravity. In contrast, like a rocket could have its own thrust, right? Like airplane, airplanes are not going in projectile motion unless something very bad happens, right? And even so, the, you know, like this I just did, or any, you know, shoot a bullet, let a plane lose its engine, there's still air friction, right? So we're neglecting that as well because we do not have the mathematics 
um, to deal with friction in here. But nevertheless, lots of physical situations, neglecting friction is, is a pretty, it's not that bad a compromise in terms of reality. All right? But admittedly, the idea of projectile motion, the idea that you can study um, motion of a, a physical body, neglecting friction, right? that's an idealization. Right? It's, not, it's not the absolute truth. But with that idealization in mind, we basically just have the acceleration for the motion is equal to 0 and minus g. In other words, the x acceleration is 0, and the y acceleration is minus g. And here g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so the g for me is just a constant of 9.8. Some books might make it 9.81. By the end of the semester, I will have wished at this point I defined it to be 10 meters per second. That would make our life so much easier in terms of calculators. But it's 9.8. I'm going to deal with it. And here's the formulas. Then, first of all, um, we have that the final velocity um, in the x direction is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. Um, and let me write that. Let me. I think it's better if I write it, v x, and put parentheses sub sub f, and v x parentheses sub not. So I'm, what I'm saying is that the initial and final x velocity, the same. So before the green marker suffered its unfortunate fate, if you could have studied its motion, its progression in x was uniform, ignoring air friction, of course. And on the other hand. The y velocity for projectiles, whoa, it survived. The y, y velocity is quite clearly changing, right? And it's changing according to the following formula. Vy, the final velocity there, will be Vy naught minus gt. So that's the, the, you know, the kinematic formula for velocity under constant acceleration of minus g. We also can talk about the equations of motion for position. The final x will be equal to the initial x plus the initial x um, velocity times time. Now, I'm, I'm just going to assume that we're starting at, let's, let's start at t equals to 0, OK? Start at t equals to 0. It makes the formula simpler to look at. If you don't mind, I'm going to start at t equals to 0. Otherwise, I'd have to put a delta t there instead of t, and I just, I'd rather just put a t, if you don't mind. And then the final, the, the y formula, yf, well, that's why not. I mean, why not? Plus, oh, I'm sorry, it's horrible. I take it back. Uh, plus v naught yt. And then the interesting thing, minus 1 half, 1 half gt squared. Now. In a projectile motion problem, you're often not actually given vx naught and vy naught. What you're given is something like this. You know, you've got some kind of some kind of motion. We can we can prove that this actually describes a parabola. If you eliminate time, you'll get the equation of a, a parabola. And anyway, so what's typically done though is is a lot of times they'll start you out, I don't know, here somewhere, do 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 do. And then, you know, he, he's got a, a bow and arrow or something, right? And uh, he, shoots his, he shoots his bow like this, yeah? And that's got some initial velocity v naught. And, and that v naught is a vector, right? It's got an x part and it's got a y part. So to, you got to figure out what is the, the x component of that velocity and what's the y component of that velocity. I'll make it bigger up here. So you got this v naught, right? And you're typically given the angle here that you're, you're firing the bow at, or the gun, or shooting the basketball, or whatever. Throwing the baby. Throw it in there. Um, so this is what we're calling v naught x. Or I, I'm sorry, I guess I was calling it v x naught. I don't know what I'm doing. What, have I, what, 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 what labels have I chosen for myself? v x naught, apparently. I reserve the right to change these labels in a future lecture to not go nuts. V y naught. What are those in terms of right triangle trigonometry? Here, v naught is the length of this right triangle, yeah? 
So trigonometry says, you know what, Vx naught is V naught cosine theta, and Vy naught is V naught sine theta. So in terms of the initial speed and initial angle, these two equations are a little bit different, right? We have that the final x is equal to the initial x plus v naught cosine theta t, and the final y is equal to the initial y plus v naught sine theta t minus one half g t squared. So oftentimes, these formulas right here are really what you want to use because a lot of times you're given the angle and the speed, all right, of the projectile. So what I wanted to do, if there's still time, hopefully there's still time, it's debatable, there may be time, I wanted to see if I could figure out what the speed is that this Lego uh, TIE fighter shoots its bullet. If we can, see if we can calculate it. What do you say? So. I need to figure, I need to, I think if I, I'm going to aim for, I'm going to go for a 45 degree angle if I can, if I can get it, all right? I'm going to try for 45 degrees. So that's something like this, right? So if I line up, line up the top like that, that's 45 degrees, right? And I need you guys to tell me where it hits, because I might not be able to see it, okay? You guys watching? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right, I think I saw it. I think that it returned to the height from which it came right here. Is that, does that seem fair? The motion of the Lego bullet was something like, something like that. Pretty, pretty approximately, but that's about it. So I, I made the angle, I made the, I made the initial V naught at theta equals to 45 degrees. Right? And we just, we saw this, this distance right here is the so-called range. All right? We're a little short on time. I'll derive it another day. But you can prove that the range is a range formula. When you start and stop at the same height in the motion, what's the range formula? I think it's v naught squared sine 2 theta over g. I think that's the range formula. Do, do any of you have a clear enough memory of your high school physics to agree or disagree with me? Is this the formula for range for a projectile under the influence of gravity that starts and stops at the same height with the initial speed v naught launched at angle theta? Is that the range formula? Hey, you guys really need to take this class. It's good. It's good. It's good. One moment, I will find it. I just want to double check before I invest any more. It's right? OK, yay. <clears throat> I, we can derive it. We need about five minutes to derive it. It's just five minutes we don't have. So what do we know here? Oh, what's the range? Can you tell me? How far is that? Let's put it in meters. Two meters. Right, so what we got is two meters equals to v naught squared sine of twice 45 degrees, right, divided by 9.8 meters per second squared, right? So this gives us that v naught is equal to the square root of 2 meters times 9.8 meters per second squared divided by the sine of 90 degrees. What's the sine of 90 degrees? It's one, right? 
the formula is biggest when you put in theta equals 45, right? Maximum range is at 45 degrees. That assumes that the same starting and stopping height are, are, are in the question. If you have different starting and stopping heights for the projectile motion, the maximum range doesn't have to be at 45 degrees. It's a different thing. Anyway, what does this work out to? 4 point what? 4.43 meters per second. Can we, I, I want to know, what's that in miles per hour? My, four meters per second means nothing to me. What's miles per hour on that? How we convert that to miles per hour? How about this? There are 1,609 meters in a mile, right? Because 1.609 kilometers is equal to a mile. So 100, 1,609 meters in a mile. And how many uh, seconds? 3,600 seconds in one hour. So if I want miles per hour, I multiply by those two conversion factors, what do I get? 4.43 times 3,600 divided by 1,609, what do I get? 9.43. 9.43 miles per hour. So, all right, so a, uh, a Lego TIE fighter shoots its uh, imaginary laser bullet at about 10 miles an hour. I think it's kind of neat, right? Could you figure that out? I mean, otherwise, you'd just have to keep shooting it and have you, like, run, your friend run by it. Like, first of all, you got to find one of those, like, police warning signs about going over the speed limit, and you got to keep running by it until you figure out, like, how fast your different running is to set the stage. And then you got to get that friend and have him run by the thing while you're shooting it until you match up, and that's how you figure out how fast it goes, right? This is much easier, right? I just think. All right, get out of here. Why are you still here? Leave.